Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Carrillo. Today, we have Duke and Kelly. He is the co-founder of Kelly Clark PC, which currently serves clients throughout the US with offices in Texas and California. He has assisted clients in structuring real estate transactions in excess of $2 billion and provides syndication and security services for clients throughout the United States, in addition to assisting clients with their acquisition and sale of commercial and residential real estate assets. So thank you very much for being on the on the uh, interview today. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. And um, I wanted to kind of, uh, before we get into SEC and all this uh, real estate, so what was, right. what was your professional background prior to starting your current business, uh, Kelly Clark? Yeah, so um, I've been practicing law for a little over 20 years. And when I started, <clears throat> I thought I was going to be in the courtroom. So like many people that go to law school, you, you see the television shows and the movies and you think that you're going to be in the courtroom trying case after case after case. So I was a litigator for a long time before I realized that people that are often involved in are not happy. So whether you're being sued or whether you're suing, whether uh, somebody's trying to put you in prison, all of those various cases I have litigated. I've either defended or prosecuted those types of cases, both on the civil side and then on the criminal side. Huh. And so I just realized that people were more happy doing real estate transactions and starting businesses. And so that's how I um, uh, gradually over my career, got involved in uh, real estate and uh, real estate transactions. Awesome. And you're located in Texas, correct? At the Texas office? Yeah. So we have offices in Southern California. We're in a, a place called Santa Barbara, California, which is about 90 miles north of Los Angeles. And then we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, area. So we have, we have two offices, but most of our clients are hunting for acquisitions around the United States and in the hottest uh, kind of multifamily markets. Yeah, for sure. So some of our listeners have, uh, have never invested in a syndication before. Can you go over a typical syndication deal structure for, let's say, a, a multifamily acquisition, which I imagine most of the listeners would be pondering investing in? Yeah, sure. So when we talk about syndication, what we're really talking about is the pooling together of investors' money uh, sufficient so that we can actually get to that loan. So like I, I usually tell people, it's like buying a home. Most of us that are homeowners, we had to show up at the closing table. We had to pay our 10% or our 20% or whatever the bank said. Here's the amount of cash that you got to show up in order to get the keys to your home. Well, buying and selling apartment buildings is really no different. It just is a very much more <laughs> money that the banks want you to show up at the closing table with. So when we are buying and selling large apartment buildings, the amount of equity that we need to show up with will largely depend on the leverage that we can on the loan side. So if we can get 80% leverage on a loan, that means that we've got to show up to the table with 20% equity. And many of us don't have millions of dollars lying around, but we have friends and family, people that love and know us and would like to own a piece of an apartment building. And so what we do is we syndicate it. We create a single entity that will be the borrower. That's the entity that will sell losses of to potential investors, and they will give us that money in order to reach that 20% or 30% uh, number that we need to reach to, to satisfy the bank's criteria about getting the keys to the apartment building. So that's really what syndication is. So anyone, any one of your listeners, Charles, that thought to themselves, I'm a owner or I'm even, I own some small commercial real estate. How do I own a piece of an apartment building? How do I do this? Syndication is a perfect vehicle for them to be able to get into the space and to be able to own uh, a piece of an apartment building. Awesome. 
So what are traditional fees charged by a sponsorship team and the sponsorship team being the general partners uh, or the ones that are actually putting together the, the syndication? These can vary wildly from deal to deal, but in general, if you're a passive investor and you're looking at one of these deals, here's the type of fees that you can expect to receive uh, to, to be disclosed to you as being charged by the sponsors. There's typically an acquisition fee. That's usually one to three points, uh, one to three percent based on the purchase price of the apartment building or the asset that's being acquired. That's typically a one-time closing that's paid at closing, that amount of fees. There's typically a monthly asset management fee that's a one to three percent uh, percentage on the gross revenue that's flowing through the apartment building. So the rents, the pet fees, the laundry, all of that is gross revenue. The sponsors are typically the managers or the asset managers for the passive investors, and they charge a fee for that. And that fee is typically 1% to 3% of the gross monthly revenue that's flowing through the apartment building. And then there will often be an equity side. So the passive investors may own 80% of the apartment building, and the sponsor syndicators may own 20%. And it's not always an 80-20. It could be 70-30 with an 8% preferred return or something in between. We're really only uh, uh, limited by our lack of creativity on the sponsorship side and what your potential investor base will, re will, will appeal to. So if you have a as sponsors taking 80% and only selling 20% to investors, that may not appeal to many yeah. investors. So it's fairly typical that the investors own the vast majority of the apartment building and they also get the vast majority of the compensation and the distributions that flow out. Awesome. And uh, in regards to distributions, how are passive investors compensated after investing? Yeah, so passive investors are largely compensated through a variety of, of distributions. So most deals, not all deals, but most deals are either the, the passive investors receive quarterly distributions or they'll receive monthly distributions. Uh, if you're on the sponsorship side, you want to make sure that those distributions are frequent enough, that you're giving enough love to your investors so that they're seeing something. If they've given you $50,000, $100,000, and they're getting no love back from you, either on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, the likelihood is they're not going to invest in your next deal. Right. And so sponsors want to incentivize and inform their investors and, frankly, get distributions out to them as soon as they possibly can so that they can come into the next deal. So what you typically will see is quarterly distributions over and above uh, expenses for the property, meaning the mm -hmm. debt service. We got to pound out the light bill. We got to pay the mortgage. We got to pay the pet fees. We got to pay the we got to pay the landscapers. All of the various costs that go into operating the apartment building are top line items of costs that come out. And then typically the investors will either reserve, receive if there's a preferred return offer on that particular will receive their preferred return. After the preferred return is paid, if there's any excess left, that is typically split between the sponsors and the investors, depending on their ownership split. Mm -hmm. So in our hypothetical, if it's a 70-30 split with an 8% preferred return, cost to operate the apartment building come first, the 8% preferred return on the initial invested capital comes out second, third, if we have any excess, 70% will go to the investors on a pro rata basis based on their percentage of ownership in the entity, and 30% will go to the sponsors. Okay. Awesome. So you work with a lot of different syndicators, and um, how would a passive investor, how would you suggest if a passive investor was uh, a potential passive investor was interested in investing? How would they vet? What would be the best ways, methods of vetting a potential sponsor or syndic um, syndicator sponsor? That's an excellent question. I get to ask this all the time because, uh, as you know, in commercial real estate, 
you're often not investing. If you're a passive investor, you're often not knowing personally, like face to face, the sponsors of the deal. And so how do you know that this is a legitimate deal? Well, you've got to do your due diligence. If you're a passive investor, you've got to get references from the sponsors. You need to know what their historical track record is. Is this their first syndication? Is this their first deal? Or are they seasoned operators? Do they know people that you know? It's not unlike kind of putting on our little detective hat. And we're going to do a little bit of investigation into whether this is an appropriate kind of suitable investment for you. So if anything, red, any red flags come up in that process of you as the passive investor vetting the potential sponsor, whether you call the references and the references say, well, I don't know this person, or a sponsor says, I, I've done deals with so-and-so, and you know so-and-so, and you call so-and-so, and they say, I don't know what you're talking about. That's a red flag. Don't, <laughs> don't invest. <laughs> don't give them your money. But if you're able to validate the information, you're able to kind of uh, work and see their historical track record. And then I'm a big believer in asking sponsors, Tell me a deal that went sideways because mm. there, if you do this long enough, there will be deals that go sideways. And I want a sponsor that's humble enough to admit mistakes or deals that haven't exactly worked out the best and that they've owned it and what they've learned from it. So if I'm talking to somebody as a potential passive investor and the sponsor is just telling me, Roses, 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 and there's no bumps in the road. That's that's a potential warning flag because the reality is that there are no guarantees in this business. Well, real estate backed securities are, in my opinion, some of the safest in the country, um, and they result in 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 many ways uh, better earns than what you're going to get if you leave your money in the bank. There are no guarantees. And so you want to know that, know all risks associated with that. So I want honesty, I want humbleness, but I also want to know it, that the sponsors have a track record that I can help verify. Yeah. Of course, if the sponsor's been through a downturn or a pullback, they've probably seen that their deals haven't uh, reached their, their estimates, their expectations, or they have um, lost money on them. So that's very important to do that, to know about that. Um, one of the things is when I initially, years back, my first passive investment, I got that private placement memorandum, the PPM. And the thing right. was, the thing was huge. And it took, me like a, <laughs> it took me like a whole weekend. I read the thing. It took me like a whole weekend to read this because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And right. um, when an investor gets that for the first time, what are like some of the key provisions um, that the investor should look at? Because a lot of it is really just boilerplate. And then there's parts of it that are, very that you know they're detailing the fees or the more important stuff that's uh, per deal right yeah so i tell all of my passive investors so when i'm not the deal counsel i'm often vetting deals for potential mm -hmm. investors because it you're right charles it can be intimidating it can almost be overwhelming and there can almost be kind of like paralysis by analysis because you get a big pack of paperwork 130, 160, 200, depending on the size of the deal, it could be a couple hundred pages of, of stuff that for most people that don't live and dwell in this strange world of syndication all the time, it's foreign. It's like a foreign language. You don't understand it. You don't know what's important, what's not important. So the reality is I tell all of my clients on the passive investor side a few key things. One, I want to what are the fees that the sponsor is receiving for structuring the deal? Mm -hmm. I tell all my passive investors it's perfectly understandable and expected that the sponsors be paid. They have massive amounts of time, energy, resources, their own money invested in these deals. They need to get paid. But I, as the passive investor, not want to know what it is, what it is that they're going to be paid. Two, what am I going to receive? If I invest into this deal as a passive investor, where is our waterfall or our plan of distribution that will, sh am I getting a preferred return? If so, what's that amount? When do the distributions begin? 
How often should I receive reporting, right? I want to know, are they going to be reporting to me monthly, quarterly, something in between that, annually? If I'm, if I'm only getting distributions once a year and I'm only receiving reports once a year, that's probably not going to fly with many of my investors. They want to be informed by their sponsors. And then most importantly, I want to know what's the exit strategy, right? Because I've given you, Charles, as the sponsor, $100,000. You've taken that $100,000, you've pooled that together with a bunch of other investors' money, and now you own and control an apartment building of which I own a slice of. How long is my $100,000 going to be tied up in this apartment building? Passive investors want to see their money grow, and they want to see what's the strategy. So is this a five-year hold, a six-year hold? Is it a three-year hold? Do the managers have the ability to sell the asset if market if the market starts to soften or they get an offer? So I want I want to know those types of things. What's the expectation of money in? What's the expectation of money out? What are the rights that I have? And what's the exit strategy? Those are kind of the hallmarks of the pinch points in the in, uh, you're going to want to see as a passive investor, and that will help hopefully sort through that jumble of 200 pages of what you think is mostly nonsense <laughs> of, you know, stacks and stacks of just stuff. So your firm will actually review it for a potential cl a client that came to you and that had a PPM that they were we thinking will. about investing. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, That's great to will. know. The, um, for a portion of investors that are based outside the United States, how does this change the structure of the syndication? I imagine this is more of a question that a sponsor would be probably asking. But um, how does it change the structure of the syndication? Or what what does something that you have to do now if uh, for, for changing that? Yeah, so, so typically we love, uh, and Uncle Sam, let's just say this, Uncle Sam loves foreign investors. So... Uncle Sam loves money from people that don't live in the United States. We love for you to invest in private offerings. I'm a big believer in, in private offerings. I think it, that small business growth in the United States is largely driven by the fuel, the fuel being private equity. So without private equity, both, both investors that live in the United States and investors from abroad, uh, our, our economy doesn't hum the same way. So in large part, we need, to, we need to help make it easy for foreign investors to invest in private placement placements. Uh, in the area of multifamily, I see all the time uh, investors from Canada, the UK, Israel, uh, China, other countries investing in these apartment deals. And the reality is what it does is it shifts back to the sponsor some extra obligation. First and foremost is we want to make sure that uh, the country or the the res the foreign investor right. that lives in the country is okay with the United States that we're not at war with them and that it's not a prohibited type of of transaction. Secondarily, we want to make sure that the foreign investor is going to actually pay their share of taxes to Uncle Sam. So remember, Uncle Sam loves people to invest in our deal. They also want uh, you to pay your fair share of taxes, and the reality is, when you're when you're a sponsor cater and you allow foreign investors to come and invest in your deal, that shifts the burden back to you if they're a foreign investor to make sure that they do uh, pay their fair share of taxes. And most operating agreements, which is the governing document that will exist after. The investment closes, so after the raise and the offering has closed, there's one document that exists between that governs how the apartment building will be run. That's called the operating agreement. Most operating agreements will contain provisions that allow the sponsors or the managers to withhold from the foreign investors' distributions mm -hmm. uh, amount, some amount of money to ensure that they actually pay their taxes. Otherwise... If we're faced with, God forbid, an audit at some point by the IRS, we want to be able to demonstrate that all of our investors, uh, our foreign-born investors, have in fact 
uh, met their tax, uh, their tax obligations for the United States. But in large part, there's absolutely no prohibition on foreign investors to invest in private offerings. And in fact, if they would qualify, if it would be a suitable investment for them as if they lived here in the United States, it would be a suitable investment for them. But we don't advise, typically, you will not find counsel that are based in the United States deal counsel that are structuring these deals that will advise them on the securities laws of other nations. So to the extent that uh, there are impacts with them in the UK or Israel or Canada. They'll need to vet those considerations with their own lawyers mm -hmm. when they're looking at whether this is an appropriate investment for them. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the IRS wants you to invest, but they don't want to be chasing people offshore for taxes. So they leave that to the sponsor, which makes perfect sense. I mean, um, the sponsor. And then as I understand it, then that, specific investor then has to file a return to get their money back if not all of it was required for taxes. That's right. But um, you work with a lot of syndicators. What is like common theme that you see in your successful syndicators that come back to you and keep on doing deals? What do you see that they're doing that maybe uh, a novice investor or novice syndicator uh, doesn't do? What, what do you see there? Um, <coughs> I think the biggest uh, rule of success that I see with most of my syndicators around the country that have wild success in being able to scale their investor base is one, uh, communication. So communication with their investors, communication when things are going well, but maybe even more importantly, communication when things are not going well. So you made a reference like, Charles, if you're getting a pro forma or projection or an estimate in the PPM and a year down the road, for whatever reason, the property is not performing at the level that was projected when you initially made your investment. As a passive investor, I want to hear uh, feedback from my sponsor as to why. Like, what are the key, uh, key issues or factors in the disparity between what I thought I was going to get and from what I get now. So I see sponsors that have good, often frequent touch points with their investors. Those sponsors are often more successful than the ones that don't. And two, we want to make it easy for our investors to invest in things. So if our sponsors are not um, able to answer our questions, if they're not uh, able to return phone calls or emails or there's some sort of lag time when we're looking at a potential investment, that's a no bueno, brother. That, but our investors are not, they, they, don't, they don't like that. They want, they want a well-oiled machine, somebody that's highly responsive, uh, somebody that gets back to them with good, clean communication. But most importantly, that they perform, right? So an investor and even if the sponsor is a little prickly even if their bedside manner is not uh awesome but yet i'm seeing those checks hit my mailbox every month or quarter i'm coming back for more yeah. so you know those are the two kind of big things that i would say that i see that differentiates between a great sponsor and and those that are just getting their feet wet and they're trying to trying to figure out exactly what the secret sauce is. Yeah, that communication is a huge thing. I was at a conference last year and um, somebody on stage was like, "How many people have invested in the syndication?" Maybe like 60, 70 percent of people raised their hand, and then they said, "How many people would like to hear more news, more communication with the sponsor?" And the majority of them kept their hands up. So it's definitely. It's, it's crazy how a, a short email or a short newsletter can go so far in letting people know because then they're, they're ready for that investment. They're ready for that, the return to be because of that email to expect what's going to happen. So, Absolutely. But um, awesome. So how can listeners learn more about you and your firm? Hey, man, we would love to hear from your listeners. We're really, it was our uh, pleasure and honor to be on your on your podcast. There's a couple ways in which uh, you can reach out and touch base with us. One, you can go to our website. Go to our website, learn more about us, whether we might be a good fit for you in, um, in your area. Our website is kellyclarklaw.com, kellyclarklaw.com. 
where you can send me a private email message and hopefully I'll be just, I'll, I'll be, uh, giving you back expect is especially what I advise my clients. And that is a response, I mean, <laughs> immediate response to your email to me, but it's my first name, Dugan, D U G A N at Kelly, K E L L E E Y Clark, C L A R K E law, L A W dot com. Or you can always call us too. I'm mean, talking to people on the phone and our number is 972-253-4440. Okay. Awesome. Well, I will put all the links and the contact information in the podcast and also in the YouTube notes. So I want to thank you so much for being on the show today and I uh, look forward to connecting with you with uh, in the near future. Thanks, Charles. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, brother. Have a good day. Hi guys, this is Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in investing in real estate and you don't know where to begin, set up a free 15-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Harborside Partners Incorporated exclusively.